My name is John, and uh, I'm a son of Zebedee, um, younger brother of um, James, you know, that famous tr- duo of James and John, this nickname, the Sons of Thunder, and I come from a place in Galilee that um, is called Capernaum, and it's a fishing village, and that's where my brother and I live, and just a little further down the way is another village called Bethsaida, and that's where Peter and Andrew, who are brothers, and they're our fishing partners, and that's what we do. We fish. Um, Our dream, believe it or not, was that we were longing to be rabbis because every Jewish boy growing up, um, that was their goal in life. But we weren't chosen. Um, We weren't chosen by the the rabbis, and even though we're known to to them and to the Pharisees and the, and the, the religious leaders, uh, it just wasn't it. So we fish. And yet um, we long for certain things. We dream about Israel, and we dream about the kingdom being restored to our great nation and our land. We have such a rich history, and we have the Torah, and we have We have the prophets, and we have King David, and we have so many people, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All of them are heroes to us, and yet we long for more. There's something inside our hearts that beats us that we long for more. Um, There's a man that has come along, and his name is John the Baptist. And I have found myself listening intently to him, hanging on every word, going way out into the desert places and remotest places to listen to this man preach about the kingdom and about, about being prepared for the Messiah and making ourselves right with God. And, and it's just stirred something in us. And I've joined, I don't know how many, thousands to go out and listening to him. And then I find myself even being included to be close to him and being one of his disciples. But um, one day, he points to someone. I happen to know him from a distance because my mother is Salome, and Salome is the sister to a woman named Mary of Nazareth. And so I know him as a cousin in a distant way, but all of a sudden, John, this man I've been following, points to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I find myself inexplicably drawn to him. And now I follow him and have been following him. See, today is not quite over for me. And, and I'm here standing next to a tomb. And I'm, I've been at the cross. And let me just back up for a moment and tell you a little bit of the journey that's brought us here to this day. You see, it started for me when finally he looked at me one day after I've become acquainted with him. I started following him and I was listening to various things. He came by and he did the unthinkable. He said, come, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. That's incredible because I had been longing to hear those things because that's what the rabbi said. The rabbis would say, come, follow me. They would issue this invitation to young boys, and I've been longing for that all my life. And he gives me this invitation, and the next thing you know, I'm leaving my nets, I'm leaving the fishing business, and I'm following Jesus. And he takes us on this incredible journey. And miracles, the sights of blind people restored, I'm seeing People healed of diseases, skin diseases. The impossible is being made possible by this man that I find myself following. And more and more, I called him rabbi. I called him teacher. It's incredible. Such experiences that I'd never seen or ever beheld. And uh, I found myself in the company of a group of other Man, of course, I was the youngest. I was, I was the youngest, and of course, in the pecking order of things, that meant I was considered last. But somehow, Jesus, I don't know why, but he seemed to pay special attention to me. He, he, he would draw me. In fact, there were times when he would exclude uh, others out, and he'd say, 
John, Peter, James, come with me. One of those such times was a little girl. She lay dead. She was not alive. And he had mourners and all sorts of things going on. And the next thing you know, Jesus is with great authority, is clearing out the room. And he says, Peter, James, John, stay here. Now, the rest of the disciples are out very close by, but it was just us three. And the next thing you know, he takes the little girl's hand and he goes, Tabitha, child, arise. And you know what? She came back to life. I saw this one who was dead come alive. It was so powerful. There's so many other things that I could keep you here for such a long time telling you about the stories about the woman at the well and some of the perspectives of various things and in my own mistakes and my own impetuous, zealous things, trying to call fire down on the Samaritans, you know, and all sorts of things that I, I got up to. And yet Jesus kept showing incredible patience with me. Wow. It's incredible. Another time, <laughs> the Peter, James, and John sort of trio that we'd become, he summons us and we go to a, a tall mountain, a high mountain, and we're up there and we're wondering what we're doing there. And the next thing you know, this incredible light and glory shines around and all sorts of things are taking place. And even Moses and Elijah show up and we're just shaking in our boots and we're we're laying prostrate and we're trying to at the same time watch and see and look and yet we're fearing for our lives as this incredible light show is taking place and this glory that's not coming down, it's actually coming out of Jesus. And we see the glory that this one holds. We're such privileged people to be there to see this. Of course, there's so many other, so many other times, countless things that I can't tell you all about, but another time that really impacted me was when he, we were, we were gathered um, to, to the pastor, Peter and John, uh, that's me, had gone to prepare the Passover. And so we were gathered there now, and we were up in the upper room, and we were having this incredible time, and I'm really right, I'm right close to you. I'm just leaning right next. I can't, I want to get so close to him. I, I want to hang on every word. He's been selling some things and saying about that he's going to die, and that he's going to be crucified, and, and you know, it's, we're just pushing it, you know, aside, because we that's the unthinkable right now. We just want to hang on every word. We want to spend every moment with this most incredible being that we call Jesus. And uh, we can't get enough. And yet at that time, he sits there and he takes a towel. He takes out his outer garment and he begins to wash our feet. It's the most unthinkable thing. That's what servants do. That's what the lowest and the lowest of servants do. They do this kind of work and he's taking our dirty, smelly feet, and he's washing them and drying them. It's doing something to us. I don't know what it was doing, but it's done something. Something has shifted in the heart as we've watched this incredible one that we call Jesus, whom, who Peter blurted out one day, saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, the Messiah, the expected one. I didn't know how quickly things would change and shift. I, I suppose we had a, a sense or an inkling as we approached Jerusalem when we came into the city that it was just like this is a different moment than we fought into the city before. And as we come to it, here he is. And he begins to prep us and speak to us in ways that he's never spoken to. But he's talking about the Holy Spirit and he's, he's, he's getting us prepared. He's talking about the vine and the branches and there's all these lessons and things. To be honest, my head is just spinning and it's filled with so many things. And yet I, I've got this terrible feeling inside. You ever had one of those where you just feel, I just know something 
is up and I don't know what. I can't quite put it all together. The next thing you know, we find ourselves in a place we'd been to before. It's called Gethsemane. It's an olive grove. And as we gather there, he separates himself out and he asks again this trio, Peter, James, and John. He says, would you guys come with me? And we're there and, and he then goes a little further and then this most agonizing dialogue with his father begins and he begins to cry and even, even blood begins to come out of his, his pores and, and it's the most intense and yet it's, it's, it's dark, it's cold, it's night and the next thing you know we're sleeping and he comes and wakes us up and we, we're trying our best but we just can't seem to stay awake because of this foreboding, this grief that's already gripped our hearts. Peter's already been told that he's going to deny him before this night's out. There's just, there's so many confusing issues. I just can't quite put it together. Things are happening so quick. And the next thing you know, these people show up. And of course, the person who's leading it is one of ours. It's Judas, of all things. And he leads his people here. And oh my goodness, the unthinkable happens. They arrest Jesus. They haul him away in chains and bonds and they take him. I try to follow as close as I can without being arrested myself. And he gets to the house of Caiaphas. And, and because I know the priest, I'm, I've got a house in Jerusalem from the tribe of Judah. My family, um, I get in. Peter's left out to the side, but I get in and I... I begin to watch the most unthinkable, have the most miscarriage of justice, lies, misquotes, all same things are happening and they're even striking him. This is, my, this is my Savior, my Lord, this is my King, this is my Messiah, this is the one that I hang on every, this is my rabbi and they're doing the most unthinkable things to do. But I'm, I'm not prepared for what is going to come. And what's going to happen? It goes quickly. The next thing you know, you're in the court of, of the Gentiles. The very Roman governor himself, Pontius Pilate. And he's standing before him. And we're a distance away. And he's being tried by the Roman government. And he's being accused by the religious leaders of all sorts of things. And... The next thing you know, the crowd is shouting, crucify. We're yelling at all the top of our lungs, no, no, but it's happening anyway. And he's bound over. And the next thing you know, we're marching down the street. (sighs) He's on his way to be crucified, killed. The unthinkables happen. But friends, everything that I've said thus far that's culminated on this day is nothing in comparison to the next few hours where he's then nailed through excruciating pain. He's nailed to a cross which is reserved for the worst of criminals. He's being identified as the worst there is. There's no one, there's no other category left. This is the most worst punishment that anybody could could ever experience. He's being nailed to a cross. How could this be? It's just impossible for me to be able to understand it. And next thing you know, he's being hoisted up next to criminals who deserve to die. And he's there hanging. And then I spot my auntie, Mary. My mother's there as well, Salome. Mary Magdalene as well, that whom we know from what Jesus had done for her, which was just so wonderful. They're there close by. So I come up next to, next to Mary, the mother of Jesus. These are the early stages of Jesus going through the processes of dying. The step by step, and he's the agony that we're watching, and it's unthinkable. He's almost unrecognizable. He is virtually unrecognizable. It's horrible what they've done to him. As we stare and we look, he does the unthinkable. 
he looks at mother, his mother, and says, woman, dear woman, behold your son. And he wasn't talking about himself. He's saying, look at John, me. And then he says to me, behold your mother. And basically right there he gives me the assignment to take the firstborn's place. To look after her. And yet she had other children and various things, but he gave me that privilege and that assignment, so I've, I've taken that. As we went through that, many things took place, many happenings are going, and, and then this most dramatic thing all of a sudden lights out. It's as dark as dark can be. There's no light at all. And the thing that happens next is that his Jesus starts to dialogue and, and, they're, and it's dark and it's frightening and we move away from the cross a little bit distance and, but still close enough to watch what's happening. And, and the next thing you know, he cries out with a loud voice and he's quoting out of Psalms, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he pauses and he does these words it is finished friends the earth quaked there were commotions in the city as people came out of the graves there was all sorts of things happening even in the temple itself there was commotions and different things that happened as the, as the veil, that very, very thick curtain from top to bottom was torn in two. We don't know what that all means yet, but something is up. Something's happened. When he said, it is finished, even earth itself registered its agreement. The day isn't finished. I'm processing so much. There's so much that I'm still like, I just can't figure it all out. I just can't put it all together. I just can't. And the next thing you know, they come and they retrieve him. Joseph of Arimathea, whom I'm acquainted with. And of course, Nicodemus, who came to my house and had a conversation with Jesus a few years ago. So they take him and they've taken him to a tomb. And here's this tomb. And the body of Jesus is in there. And every hope and every dream and every thought of anything that I ever dreamed and hoped and believed for myself or in a far bigger picture than me, for my nation, for, for Israel, and all the promises and all the things are in that tomb right now. There's something about me, it's a trait I have, is I stare at things. It's kind of a bad habit, but I, I look and I stare. And I've been staring at this tomb and I've been... I took time to stare at the cross and I looked and took every detail I could possibly because deep down, though I'm confused, I can't put it all together. I'm, I don't know all the things that he said that is all in order in my head or mind right now. But I'll tell you this, something inside me tells me there's something at play here that's far bigger than I know. Far bigger. And here's what I have to do. And I invite you to do the same. I have to bow my knee because though I don't understand it and though every hope and dream I have is in that tomb with a body in there and I don't know where he is right now. But let me tell you this. I have to bow my knee. I have to get down. Bow in something that's far bigger than me. And to a hope, perhaps, just maybe, just maybe what he said 
When I think of Jairus, when I think of Lazarus, when I think of just maybe what he said will happen. Just maybe. He'll rise from the dead. ask the team to distribute the emblems that Jesus gave. I'm so glad he didn't um, invent some elaborate systematic deal. He gave simply a cup and a piece of bread. And so what we do is take it, hold it, and in just a moment or two we're going to 
partake together of this communion. We'll take the cup and we'll take the bread. So in your own way, take this moment, seize it. You've gotten up. Take a moment of personal reflection. Take a moment to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for me. Will you do that? Good. Thank you. So I think there's some, if you've finished off to the sides, maybe here in the center part, just help in that way. It was during a meal. It was that same meal as I was speaking about with John that where Jesus took the towel and he washed the disciples' feet. It was in that context that in the meal, he took a cup and he took bread. And he lifted them out of what is called the Seder meal, which is the Passover meal. And he took them out and separated it out and said, this bread, he identified it and said, this is my body. The housing that is being used, um, it's being set apart and sanctified. It's set apart bread, my life, my body for you. And the body is, is the housing of our humanity, our soul and our spirit person. And, and uh, that's the body that suffered for you. It was bruised for your iniquities, family histories and, and bents. It's the chastisement of your well-being, your inner world well-being as well as your outer world was upon him. 
He's bruised for our iniquities. He was pierced through for our transgressions. Ours, yours, mine, the entire world. And so all he asks in the simplicity of this, he says, would you do something for me? I've done all this for you, but would you not forget me in all your busyness of life, in all that you go through, and everything that ever goes on in your life? Will you take time out of your busy schedules, and will you lift a piece of bread and take a cup, and will you stop to remember me? And don't forget what I've done for you. Because the world will. But those who are my followers, I need you to remember. So that's why we're doing this, folks, is we're remembering him. Let's protect. Thank you, Father. He lifted that cup and when he said this it was almost unthinkable and it's hard for it to fully comprehend but he said this cup represents my blood which is my life and he said it's being given as a sacrifice to, for the sins of the entire world entire world past present future whoa that's huge it's in that package he says don't forget it remind yourself you're in the cup you're in here because his life was given instead of yours you're in the cup You're in his life. Your life is bound up in his life. So let's remember him well right now and partake. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's declare that. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided <laughs> to follow Jesus, no turning back, no, no turning back. Lord, those are our, that, that captures the heart. To who else will we go to? You alone have the words of eternal life. And Lord, if there's someone here today that has not yet bowed the knee, who's yet to put their hopes, their trust in Jesus Christ, we pray today that somehow they may find their way to you. We can help in any way, but God, they could come and turn their life over to you. And so Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for... Jesus for what you did for all of humanity and we give you honor and praise today in Jesus name Amen Amen. We just want to uh, personally invite you that on Sunday we have our normal uh, time frames of 8.45 and 10.45 and of course we've got the set now and the, and the stone and we're going to have to come and find out whether the stone gets rolled away or not you know and so we've got that uh, coming up at 8.45, 10.45. And then afterwards at Thai Park over in the Welcome Bay area off of Forrester Drive is a church picnic, a time together. And it looks like the weather will, will cooperate. It may be raining on late Saturday on through the night, but they say on Sunday morning it should clear away. So our hope is that we'll be able to do that. So let's plan for it and be together and have a great time. And uh, if you're going away, be safe on the roads. Drive sensibly and, and, and say a prayer before you start every trip, eh? Is that good? God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Greet somebody before you leave out. God bless. Thanks, Steve.